So, Matthew, what's the latest as you understand it? And, 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 and what are you able to tell us about this venue and what was happening? Who was there? Yeah, Aaron, I mean, horrific scenes. I mean, you, you, you hear those gunshots there, and this would have been a, a shopping mall and a concert venue that was absolutely packed with people. In fact, uh, there was this Soviet-era band that was playing that night, and they'd sold 6,500 tickets uh, for the concert. And that's when we see those images of, of the auditorium that was absolutely packed. They'd gone there to see this concert. That didn't happen. This attack happened uh, before the band got on stage. But uh, what we know is that at least four individuals, according to local authorities, according to the video we've seen as well, some of which is absolutely horrific, horrific. shows at least four of these people dressed in camouflage fatigues, carrying automatic weapons. There are some videos that show them firing indiscriminately into you know, crowds of people in the, in the shopping mall. Mm. It's absolutely terrible. You can see the response of the emergency services there. 50 ambulances at one moment uh, were sent to that, that shopping mall on the outskirts of Moscow. Firefighters as well. Apparently now they've controlled the blaze uh, that has been raging through the shopping centre that was set by the attackers. It's been localised, but it's not been extinguished. 40 people, according to the, the, the preliminary figures, have been killed. More than 100, something like 140 people now, in fact, the authorities are saying, have wow. been injured. But obviously that figure could get much, much higher. It could go much, much higher. And as you put the emphasis on preliminary when it comes to the killed, uh, we just don't know. Um, you know, at first, uh, Russian authorities had seemed, you know, there had been... Um, you know, immediate slamming at, at Ukraine, and it, it's you know what, it was unclear where this was going to go. Um, but obviously now ISIS is claiming responsibility. How does an attack like this inside Russia reflect on Vladimir Putin? Obviously, in the days following his obviously uh, sham election. Yeah, well, it's it's extraordinary, isn't it? Because Vladimir Putin. Um, you know, sells himself to the Russian people as the provider, the guarantor of stability and security. But you know, Russia at the moment looks more unstable than it has for years. There, there are a number of fronts in which Russians, frankly, are dying. I mean, we talk about the Ukraine war. Hundreds of thousands of people uh, from Russia have been killed or injured, according to Western es estimates, in that conflict. Last year, there was that uprising from Yevgeny Prigozhin, a Putin ally, so uh, an uprising from his own ranks, and now these terrorist attacks, or this terrorist attack uh, in Moscow. It's, it's like all sides Putin's facing a security challenge. All right, Matthew Chance, thank you very much. I said, Matthew, I just returned from Moscow. I want to bring in now the retired General Wesley Clark, the former NATO Supreme Allied Commander and military analyst here, of course, and also CNN contributor on Russian affairs, longtime uh, Russia and Moscow Bureau Chief Jill Doherty. So thanks so much to both of you. And Jill, to the point where Matthew's saying, right, that uh, Putin is, uh, prides himself and maintains his power by maintaining security, and now you have... In the context of a war, mass mobilizations, and many dead, one of the deadliest terror attacks in Russia in decades. Can you put that into perspective? Yeah, you know, I think it's kind of complicated, Aaron, because immediately people who know Russia are going to think of previous uh, incidents, terrorist attacks that were used, exploited by President Putin to take action. It could be cracking down on society, uh, more mobilization, whatever it is. And they go back, and I covered all of them, 1999, yeah. you know, back to 2002, 2004, et cetera. So that's one side of it. But the other side of it is this really looks bad for Vladimir Putin because it is a major attack. And if this is happening on his watch, when he is supposedly the protector of Russia, it, it just pales in comparison. So I think, um, you know, the most important thing now is that we have to watch is who are they going to blame for this? Um, that's number one. And then blaming somebody, what will they do with that? How will they exploit and use that blame? Yeah, and General Clark, you know, at first there had been, uh, you know, from, from Moscow, the the slamming of the Kyiv regime, uh, you know, so it seemed that that's the direction they were going, right? Blame Ukraine. Um, now, though, ISIS is claiming responsibility and has come out and claimed responsibility, whether they did or didn't do it, uh, they are claiming it. Is that in line with what you think may have happened? <clears throat> it is in line because I don't think the uh, Ukrainians are going to go after a target like this. I think they go after 
uh, oil refineries, right. radar sites, military targets. This is clearly a war crime. Uh, they wouldn't do it uh, as much as they're angry at Russia and as much as something like this would bring the war home to the people in, in Moscow who have been relatively supportive of Mr. Putin. But still, I, I think it, the Ukrainian government just wouldn't do this. There's no doubt about Ukrainians working against the Russians. There are attacks in Belgorod. There are Ukrainian agents penetrating Russia. Uh, there's drones coming in. The security in Russia is sort of out of balance, I would guess, from all of this. And as Jill said, Putin's trying to mobilize people and send them to the front. And, and so there's a lot going on there. But this has all the hallmarks of ISIS. And Jill, the, thing, the interesting thing about this is, is that when you talk about the deadliest attack in decades, no matter who perpetrated it, uh, 40 dead, the injured count is going up, the dead count very well may rise significantly, we simply don't know, and yet silence. Putin still has not spoken publicly, has not said anything. Uh, what, what do you make of that? Well, um, also, we have to note that the, the uh, media, the state-controlled media, are not saying much of anything either. So I think right now, in the Kremlin, they are trying to figure out, number one, who did this, and number two, what do they say about it? Because until they say something about it, everyone is frozen in place. There will be a narrative. There will be something that they will say, and then it will be spread all across the media and with all of their officials. But we just have to wait. And General Clark, the U.S. last weekend said within, I believe it was 48 hours, that they thought there could be an attack. They said on public spaces, they mentioned specifically uh, music performances and concert venues. Now, they were wrong in the 48-hour timeline, but a few days later, that exact thing occurred. And they warned. Americans. They publicly put this out there. Apparently, they warned Russia. So wh what do you make of the fact that it still happened? Well, I think that there's still a lot of communications between the United States government and the Russian government. And particularly in, in this case, it sounds like the United States picked up some indicators, uh, either listening or, or informants or something, and passed the information to the Russian government. Uh, ISIS is a, not just a threat to Russia. It's a, a threat beyond Russia. So uh, it's in the United States' interest to take action against ISIS, even if it were going to do a strike in Russia. All right. Thank you both very much. General Clark and Jill, thank you.